This is revelations.unveil.detroit. Family, you ever wonder why the police can pull you over, shake you down, stop and frisk you, take your property, seize it, forfeit it, break into your home, kick down the doors, destroy all your property, how you can be manhandled, physically abused, and traumatized by the police with no repercussion. How is it that the police, the cops, the sheriffs, the agency of enforcement in the states and municipalities across America, how can they brutalize the citizens of the society? How can they kill and not be held responsible? How is it that they can have long records of complaints and several lawsuits against them? How is it that the policing unions and the fraternal orders and the fraternal organizations and brotherhoods of these police officers never endure the stigma or the suffering of the brutality and trauma and treason they impose upon the populace of America. Well, in this series, or the second part of this series, Fuck the Police, we will get more clarity on this tool, on this legal precedent, on this legal doctrine that these police rely on when they commit these wicked acts against the citizens. This qualified immunity doctrine, which gives them all rights to commit perverse acts against the people. So we'll be reviewing an article from Reuters as it pertains to qualified immunity and the Supreme Court's leverage of the policing powers. And we began. Special report, Reuters.com. For cops who kill, special Supreme Court protection. In Medill, Oklahoma, sick with pneumonia, agitated and confused, Johnny Leha refused to return to his hospital room. Moments later, with three police officers pinning him on the floor, Leha was dead at age 34. Staff at the local hospital in tiny Medill, Oklahoma, had called the police in the early evening of March 24th, 2011, for help giving Leha an injection to calm him. Security cameras captured much of the ensuing encounter. The officers, after shooting Leha with a stun gun, follow him down a corridor, shock him again, and wrestle him to the floor. One officer then straddles Leha's back, trying to handcuff him as the others struggle to pull back his arms. They got one handcuff on. Leha goes limp. The officers step back. 
hospital staff dropped to Leha's side and began a futile effort to resuscitate him. The Oklahoma Chief Medical Examiner's Office determined that Leha, his lungs already compromised by pneumonia, was starved for oxygen in his struggle with police and died from respiratory insufficiency. The county sheriff and the Medill police chief defended the officer's actions as appropriate to the situation. The officers were not charged with any wrongdoing. Irma Aldaba, however, blamed the officer for her son's death. My son wasn't a criminal. My son was sick, she said in an interview. So Aldaba took the only other route open to people in her situation. She sued. Her lawsuit in federal district court in Muskogee, Oklahoma, alleged that the three officers used excessive force, violating her son's civil rights under the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which protects against unreasonable search and seizure. But almost immediately, her case hit a formidable obstacle, a little-known legal doctrine called qualified immunity. This 50-year-old creation of the Supreme Court is meant to protect government employees from frivol frivolous litigation. In recent years, however, it has become a highly effective shield in thousands of lawsuits seeking to hold cops accountable when they are accused of using excessive force. At first, it looked like Aldabo would clear the hurdle. The judge hearing her case and then a federal appeals court rejected the officer's claim of qualified immunity. The appeals panel based it on, or the appeals panel based its decision on a two question test courts use to weigh police requests for immunity. The first is whether the evidence shows or it could convince a jury that the officers used excessive force in violation of the Fourth Amendment. The second question is whether the officers should have known they were breaking clearly established law, which is in quotes. A Supreme Court, uh, a Supreme Court coinage for a court precedent that had already found similar police actions to be held illegal. So in essence, family, the questions are, did they use effect or excessive force in violation of the Fourth Amendment? Or did the police know they were breaking a quote unquote clearly established law that was already found to be illegal? To both questions, the court determined the answer was yes. Then, at the officer's request, the Supreme Court intervened. The justices ordered the appeals court to reconsider its ruling, indicating that they disagreed with the lower court. Back at the appeals court, Aldaba's lawyers argued as he had the first time around, that the cop's treatment of Leha was clearly established as illegal. To support his argument, he cited earlier cases in which police were held liable for using excessive force on unarmed, mentally compromised people. Not similar enough, the court now said. So the cops had no reason to think they were breaking the law. The police got immunity. Miss Aldaba's case was dead. 
it makes me feel that there was a mistake. But we can't win, Miss Aldaba 60 said. We can't win fighting the cops. An effective barrier. Miss Aldaba's lament has become an increasingly common one. Even as the proliferation of police body cameras and bystander cell phone video has turned a national spotlight on extreme police tactics, qualified immunity under the careful stewardship of the Supreme Court is making it easier for officers who kill or injure civilians with impunity. The Supreme Court's role is evident in how the federal appeals courts, which take their cue from the high court, treat qualified immunity. In an unprecedented analysis of appellate court records, Reuters found that since 2005, the courts have shown an increasing tendency to grant immunity in excessive force cases, ruling that the district courts below them must follow. The trend has accelerated in recent years. It is even more pronounced in cases like Lehas, when civilians were unarmed in their encounters with police and when courts concluded that the facts could convince a jury that police actually did use excessive force. Reuters found among the cases it analyzed more than three dozen in which qualified immunity protected officers whose actions had been deemed unlawful outside of Dallas, Texas or outside of Dallas, Texas. Five officers fired 17 shots at a bicyclist who was 100 yards away, killing him in a case of mistaken identity. Okay, so that's an example case. We're going to reread it. Outside Dallas, Texas, five officers fired 17 shots at a bicyclist who was 100 yards away, killing him in a case of mistaken identity. In Heber City, Utah, an officer threw to the ground an unarmed man he had pulled over for a cracked windshield, leaving the man with brain damage. In Prince George's County, Maryland, an officer shot a man in a mental health crisis who was stabbing himself and trying to slit his own throat. So the family, these are examples of instances where excessive force was used against civilians where it was deemed unlawful. The increasing frequency of such cases has prompted a growing chorus of criticism from lawyers, legal scholars, civil rights groups, politicians, and even judges that qualify immunity as applied is unjust. Spanning the political spectrum, this broad coalition says the doctrine has become a nearly fail-safe tool to let police brutality go unpunished and deny victims their constitutional rights. The High Court has indicated it is aware of the mounting criticism of its treatment of qualified immunity after letting multiple appeals backed by the doctrine's critics pile up. The justices are scheduled to discuss privately as soon as May 15th. So that was two days ago, family. They had private discussions as it pertains to the backlog of critics who have sent in submissions for this qualified immunity doctrine. If any 
of the 11 such cases they could hear later this year. All right, so we have some profound or precedent setting cases to be heard in terms of excessive force, police brutality, and qualified immunity. Justice Sonia Sotomayor, one of the court's most liberal members, and Clarence Thomas, its most conservative, have in recent opinions sharply criticized qualified immunity and the court's role in expanding it. In a dissent to a 2018 ruling, Sotomayor joined by fellow liberal Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote what, that the majority's decision favoring the cops tells police that they can shoot first and think later and it tells the public that palpably unreasonable conduct will go unpunished hmm. we pretty much get a sense of that family and society so called or us so called blacks or African Americans or Negroes we already know there's a shoot first think later ask questions later no questions asked policy with the policing force of America since our being brought here into captivity. So this is something that is common knowledge amongst a population. In that case, Kessler versus Hughes, the justices threw out a lower court's ruling that denied immunity to a Tucson, Arizona cop who shot a mentally ill woman four times as she walked down her driveway while holding a large kitchen knife. A year earlier, Sotomayor, in another dissent, called out her fellow justices for a disturbing trend of favoring police. We have not hesitated to summarily reverse courts for wrongly denying officers the protection of qualified immunity, Sotomayor wrote, citing several recent rulings. But we rarely intervene where courts wrongly afford officers the benefit of qualified immunity. Justice Sotomayor was responding to the majority's decision not to hear an appeal brought by Ricardo Salazar Limon, who was unarmed when a Houston police officer shot him in the back, leaving him paralyzed. A lower court had granted the officer immunity. The Reuters analysis supports Justice Sotomayor's assertion that the Supreme Court has built qualified immunity into an often insurmountable police defense by intervening in cases mostly to favor the police. Over the past 15 years, the High Court took up 12 appeals of qualified immunity decisions from police, but only three from plaintiffs, even though plaintiffs asked the court to review nearly as many cases as the police did. The court's acceptance rate for police appeals seeking immunity was three times its average acceptance rate for all appeals. For plaintiffs' appeals, the acceptance rate was slightly below the court's average. So we see, family, that the court is tainted in favor of this policing agency. So they put down the laws, the policing agencies are their enforcing arm, hand, or fist, and of course they must lean to that favor. In the cases it accepts, the court nearly always 
decides in favor of the police. The high court has also put its thumb on the scale by repeatedly tweaking the process. It has allowed police to request immunity before all evidence has been presented. And if police are denied immunity, they can appeal immediately an option unavailable to most other litigants who typically must wait until after a final judgment to appeal. So the policing forces are already fast tracked. They can ask for immunity before the case is um, submitted and they can ask for an immediate appeal upon the case determination and they will be fast tracked for a hearing whereas any other parties must wait and then these are time frames of months and years before an appeal can be filed reviewed and even be determined to be heard you get the impression that the officers are always supposed to win and the plaintiffs are supposed to lose. University of Chicago law professor William Baud said, in his research, Baud has found that qualified immunity as a doctrine enjoys what he calls privileged status on the Supreme Court, which extends to cases the court decides without even hearing arguments, a relatively rare occurrence. In such cases, the court disproportionately reversed lower court's denials of immunity. All nine current justices declined to be interviewed. They have offered few explanations of the court's stance on qualified immunity beyond writing in opinions that the doctrine balances individual rights with the need to free officials from the time-consuming and costly burden of unnecessary litigation. Defining what is, quote-unquote, clearly established. The main challenge for plaintiffs in excessive force cases is to show that the police behavior violated a quote unquote clearly established precedent. The Supreme Court has continually reinforced a narrow definition of clearly established, requiring lower courts to accept as precedent only cases that have detailed circumstances very similar to the case they are weighing. We have repeatedly told courts not to define clearly established law at a high level of generality, the court wrote in November 2015 opinions. Repeating its language from an earlier ruling in in an earlier ruling. Now, in that 2015 opinion, The justices reversed a lower court decision and granted immunity to Texas State Trooper Chandran Mullenix, who had stopped a high-speed chase by shooting at a vehicle from an overpass, killing the driver. 